Greetings again today in the name of Jesus Christ, our wonderful Lord and Savior. Now we're glad to see you in the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church today. We welcome every one of you. May the Lord bless you. We welcome the visitors that are with us today. I'm hoping that God will bless and warm our hearts as we've come here to worship in the Northside Baptist Church on this Lord's Day. And to you that's listening out in the radio listening audience, we most certainly appreciate you tuning in to the Northside Baptist Church Hour that's coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Church here in Athens, Georgia. Now this is Preacher Edwards speaking, and I hope you in the radio listening audience, if you know of a shut-in, a friend, that could uh, get the broadcast today, if you'll call them on the phone, have them tune in and pick up the broadcast. We appreciate it so very much. We'll try to be a blessing to them. The Garners got acquainted with Robin on the Holy Interior year before last. And uh, Robin went back again last year and she sang for us on the tour this last time. She sang in the Bible Baptist Church over in Jerusalem and sang in, other, sang in other places. And she's a real blessing. And she says she's going back next year, but I don't know why she's going to get the money. You know, it's good to dream and hope and pray and wish. But that don't uh, put the money in your pocket, does it? But it's good to have good intentions and faith and hope and desire. And I wish that all of my grandchildren could go every year. Well, as my children, my in-laws and my outlaws and the whole gang. But uh, can't, all of them can't go every year. But it's always a wonderful trip. And if you've never been, why... You ought to try to go. Some of you out in the radio listening audience, maybe you've never taken a real trip of this type. Some of you reach retirement age. You ought to use some of it to go to the Holy Land. It'll be a trip of a lifetime. This next year, the Lord willing, in March, we plan to go over into Jordan and then cross Jordan into Israel. We're going to ride down that beautiful desert. We rode from Jerusalem to Egypt last year on the bus. Across that desert, I'm telling you, that's an amazing sight to see. And then we go into Egypt, of course, and visit the pyramids, the Sphinx, and see the Nile River and where Moses was found in the bulrush, and visit the museum and see the, the items they got out of King Tut's tomb when it was discovered. There's a coffin there of solid gold, weighs about 245 pounds and other great things they took out of that tomb. It's amazing. And we plan to visit that museum again in Egypt this year, that is next year, and then leave there and go into Vienna, Austria, and some of the beautiful sites in the capital of Austria we plan to see. It's a 10-day trip, a trip of a lifetime. If you're interested, you ought to write in and get a brochure. Call me or come by to see me, and uh, I'll be glad to supply you with a Brochure on the trip, telling you when we leave, when we're coming back, how much it costs, where we'll be going. And so you think about it and pray about it. If you have your Bibles, you turn to the book of Job, will you please? I wanted to bring another message, but the Lord would let me do it. God laid this message on my heart, and you have heard me speak on the book of Job maybe several times. And if God lets me live, you'll hear me speak on it many other times. I'm going to be reading in three different places. Now I'll read first of all from Job chapter 3, which is found on page 571 in the original Schofield Reference Bible, page 571. You know, people all move the right, and he jerked the left line when he wanted to go to the left, and he did that continually. And this man watched him, and the man said to him, said, Mr. said, I just noticed when you wanted that mule to go to the right, you pulled that right line with a big jerk. When you wanted him to go to the left, you pulled the left line with a big jerk. said, why don't you just say G for him to go to the right and say Har for him to go to the left? Why, well, he said, man, this mule kicked me six years ago, and I haven't spoken to him since. And so a lot of times uh, people will cut their nose off despite their face. So... He hadn't spoke to that mule in six years because he kicked him. Now when you look at uh, the book of Job chapter uh, 3, I'm going to use this as subject. You've heard me use this before, but it's a little enticing maybe to help you to listen more attentively. And my subject is, can't eat a bite, can't sleep at night, the woman I love, 
won't treat me right. Now, isn't that some subject? You may say, preacher, is that uh, based on the Bible? Yes, it is. Now, you look at uh, in the book of Job chapter 3 and look at verse uh, 24. Verse 24 in chapter 3, page 571. Now, he said here, for my sign cometh before I eat, and my rowings are poured out like water. Now what Job is really saying here is I just can't eat. My sign comes before I eat. I, I just get in such shape I don't have any appetite and I can't eat. I just can't eat. I can't eat a bite. Now I want to read some more scripture in Job chapter 7. Turn over to chapter 7 will you please. And look at verses 3 and 4 of Job chapter 7 page 573. So am I made to possess months of vanity and wearsome nights upon unto me. When I lie down, I say, when shall I rise and the night be gone? I'm full of tossing to and fro under the dawning of the day. Now here the man Job is saying, I just can't uh, sleep at night. I can't eat a bite and I can't sleep at night. Now look at Job chapter 2, will you please? Turn back to your left to Job chapter 2, page 570. And look at verses 9 and 10. Then said his wife unto him, Does thou still retain thy integrity? Curse God and die. But he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What shall we receive good at the hand of God? And shall we not receive evil? In all this did not Job sin with his lips. Here in these verses we found that Job's wife did not treat him right. So Job is a man that couldn't eat a bite, he couldn't sleep at night, the woman he loved didn't treat him right. And so we're going to bring a message based on that thought. Now Job lived before the law of Moses. The book of Job is one of the oldest books in the Bible and he lived on the earth back before the law of Moses was ever written. Now the reason is you never find why Job ever quoted from the law of Moses, not one time. And evidently he lived and this book was written back before the law of Moses. Now we find the Lord quoted from the book of Job himself. The Lord quoted from Job, if you read Job chapter 39 and verse 30, and compare that with Matthew chapter 24 and verse 28, you find the Lord Jesus there referred to the book of Job. And also the Apostle Paul referred to the book of Job. Paul referred to it in, uh, if you compare Job chapter 5 verses 12 and 13 to 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 16, you'll find there that Paul cited from the book of Job. Now the Ezekiel the great uh, prophet, he also referred to the book of Job. If you read Ezekiel chapter 14 verses 14 and 20, you'll find there that the prophet Ezekiel referred to the book of Job. And then Brother James in the book of James also referred to the book of Job. If you read James chapter 5, James talked about the patience of Job. And so we find the book of Job referred to many times, although it was written before any part of the Bible was ever written to be in the canon of the scriptures. Because it was Moses that wrote the first five books in the Bible and the book of Job was written before Moses penned those first five books of the Bible because Job never one time referred to them, evidently never read them. They were not at his disposal at that time. Now Job was a great man. I don't know why God wanted me to bring this message today. But a lot of times people go through troubles and sorrows and heartaches and testings and trials and if they would go to the book of Job and read from the Word of God in the book of Job, many times they can get strength. I have a preacher friend, a drunk killed his little daughter on the highway and put his wife in the hospital and she lay there for weeks and weeks between life and death, not knowing whether she would live or not, but she did finally uh, live, that is she got well. And his little daughter was killed, his little 11 year old daughter, and he was a preacher. And he was preaching a revival at the time it happened. And the word came to him that his family had been involved in a wreck, that a drunk had run into his automobile and had killed his little daughter, and his wife was in the hospital. On the way back home, 
The devil said, I want you to look what happened. Here you go night after night preaching. You've given your life into the ministry. You say you're God's servant. You up there winning souls to God. And I want you to look what happened. I have killed your daughter and your wife might not live. He said the devil got on his back and rode him all the way home just about it. And he was so depressed, he was just about ready to really listen to the devil. And God spoke into his heart and mind and said, remember Job. And he said, when God spoke in his heart and mind and said, remember Job. Then he said, get thee behind me, Satan. Job buried 10 children and his wife turned against him. His friends turned against him. This man, Job, followed 10 children to the graveyard. Beloved, listen to me. There's many of you that's followed your child to the graveyard and placed their bodies in the cemetery. And my heart goes out to you, but this man, Job, followed 10 to the grave. And he was a good man, a godly man, the greatest man that was living on the face of the earth in his day. Now, just because you're wholly consecrated to God, you're living for the Lord, you're doing what God wants you to do, that doesn't mean that you'll never have any trials or testings or temptations. You may have, and you probably will have. Now, the man Job, according to Job chapter 1 and verse 8, was the best man walking in shoe leather, living on God's green earth in that day. There was not a man of God in the whole world as close to God as Job was. You'll find that in Job chapter 1 and verse 8. This man Job feared God and he hated sin. When his children would go out on a party, he was so close to God until he would slip alone and there prepare an altar and make a sacrifice for his children just in case they did something at that party or that night while they were out they should not have done. And he would offer an offering unto God in their behalf. How many parents today when their children are out at night ripping up and down the highways, going to different places, how many parents today get on their knees and pray to God for their children while they're out at wild parties? Now Job did that. There used to be a great and godly mother. When her children went out on Saturday night, she went on her knees. As she did not get off of her knees until that last child came in on Saturday night. Then mother went to bed. We don't have many mothers like that today. There's not so much concern. But Job was. Job was a man that was zealous and concerned about his children. And he did not want them to do anything wrong. And just in case they did, he wanted to make an offering in their behalf. Now Job served God. He served God because he loved the Lord. Now the devil came along and the devil said to God, he said the only reason that Job is serving you is what he can get out of it. You've heard people say, well, that preacher, the only reason he's preaching today is for the money. The only reason he's preaching is what he can get out of it. My beloved God's men today, the anointed of God, if that's what they were preaching for, they can make most of them can make far more money in some other kind of business than they could in the ministry. As a whole today, are you listening to me? As a whole today, the pastors are the most underpaid men in their profession than any men in America today in, 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 in preparing them, comparing them with other professions and men in other professions like lawyers and doctors and men of that type. The pastor is the most underpaid. And a lot of people don't know that, don't realize that, yet they accuse they accuse ministers of being out for money. I do know a lot of preachers handle a lot of money. But they handle it to the glory of God to get the job done. To pay for TV time and radio time and, and the work of God. They have to handle a lot of money. Or they couldn't do the job they're doing. But that average pastor out here today pastoring his flock is greatly underpaid in comparison with many of his own members and many of other people in other professions. There's many businessmen and men with jobs today in churches that make twice as much money as their pastor makes. 
And many of them, if you'd say, well, let's raise the pastor's salary, they wouldn't be farmed. And yet they make twice as much money as the pastor. You'll find that in a lot of churches. Now that's what the devil said about Job. The devil said, Job is only serving you for what he can get out of it. And God said to the devil, you're a liar. We'll find out about that. And we'll put him to the test and see about that. And so Job, the great man of God, was put to the test. He was a holy man. He was a righteous man. And the devil said to God, let me wade in on him. God said, I'll tell you now, I don't believe Job will deny me. The devil said, well, if you take what he's got, he'll curse you. And God said, I don't believe a word of it. The devil said, let me have a shot at him. I, I, let me get everything he's got. And I'll prove to you that he'll curse you. God said, all right now, devil, we'll just find out about my servant Job. But God said, there's one thing you can't touch. You can't touch his soul. I'll let you touch what he has and touch his body, but not his soul. And the devil said, all right, if I take what he's got away from me, I'll curse you to your face. God said, I don't believe it. And so the devil was turned loose on Job. And he sent a cyclone, a tornado, and he sent lightning. And there he destroyed Job's cattle, all of his camels, destroyed uh, all of his animals that he had that he used to make his money. And then he slayed his children, he killed his children, he slew Job's children, he had ten children, and he killed every last one of them. And then all of Job's friends turned against him. He didn't have a friend in the land, not a one. And then God uh, let the devil touch Job's body. And Job's body broke out with sore boils from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. Now you know how badly one little boil on your body can hurt. You could have a boil on your body as big as the end of your thumb. And you go to bed at night and that thing will start throbbing and you can't rest, you can't sleep. And it'll just torment you all night long. Now this man Job had them all over his body from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. And then in addition to that, his wife came out and, and said, Job, what you need to do is to backslide on God and let him kill you and get you out of that misery. But Job didn't do it. Now Job said, naked came out out of my mother's womb. And he said, uh, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now when the devil took everything he had, then Job did not curse God. He did not backslide. He did not become embittered. He said, the Lord gave me everything I got. And now the Lord is taking away everything I have. And blessed be the name of God. I am not going to deny the Lord. The Bible says in Psalms chapter 34 and verse 19, many are the affliction of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. Now Job had great trials. He lost all he had. He first he lost his sheep. He lost his oxen. He lost his camels. He lost his asses. He lost his servants. He lost his children. And his wife was under a great strain. And she came to the place where she could take it no more. She saw her husband suffering. He had lost his health. He was moaning and groaning there in ashes on the earth. And she couldn't stand it. And she broke under that strain. At the very time that he needed her most, she could not help him. At the very time he needed her prayers, her encouragement, she could not help the man. She broke under that strain. And she said, Job, I can't stand to look at you anymore. I can't stand to see you suffer anymore. But if you'll just go ahead and curse God, then God will kill you and get you out of your misery. And Job looked his wife in the eyes and he said to her, he said, you talk like a foolish woman to me. He said, I'm not going to charge God foolishly. I don't think God has made a mistake. I believe that God is doing what he think is best for me. And Job chapter 2 and verse 9 then said his wife unto him, Does I still retain thy integrity? Curse God and die. Go ahead and backslide. 
Go ahead and curse God like the devil said you would and let God bump you off and get out of your misery. Job said, if God kills me, I'm still going to serve him. There was a man that had buried 10 children, that had lost all of his wealth, that had lost his health, and even the very time he needed his wife, she turned against him. And there was a man standing alone. And he said, though God kills me, I'm still going to serve him. I'm not going to backslide on God. How much testing can you take today? How many trials can you take today? How well can you stand up on the pressure today? You don't know what you may have to go through before you leave this world. The devil was really after Job. In addition to all this, the devil kept pounding on him. Three of his neighbors came around. And they sat there for seven days and looked at Job and didn't even speak a word to him. Just sat right there and looked at him. And wouldn't even speak to him for seven days and nights. Just stared at him. Can you imagine the man of God with those boils on his body? His wife begging him to curse God and die. Having lost everything he had. And then three of his neighbors come up nosing around and just sat there and gazed at him for seven days and wouldn't even speak to him. And when they finally did speak to him, they said, well, I'll tell you, Brother Job, said if you weren't a big old hypocrite, well, you wouldn't be in that condition. Said the reason you're in that shape is because you're a hypocrite. You, you got some sin in your life and you're not living right. That's the reason you're in that condition. While there was a greater man on the face of God's earth than Job. And his neighbors, they passed their judgment on him. And it was a wrong judgment. You know, it's always about easy to pass your judgment on somebody else. Something can happen to some other family. Oh, yeah, yeah, I knew that was going to happen to them. Yeah, they, that happened to them because they did thus and thus. Now, you better be careful how you judge people that way. You don't know. You can pass your opinion, but you don't know. Some of the greatest saints of God in the world have suffered tremendously and they were living for God the very best they know how. Don't ever pass your judgment in that respect. Punishment or heartache or sickness or death may come because of chastisement and it may not. It may come merely as a testing. And if you pass your judgment and say that person's having to suffer like that because of what he did to me or because he did wrong, you are passing judgment. You are joining Job's friends, the so-called, and passing judgment when you don't really know what you're talking about. You might just say in your mind, that might be the case. I don't know. See, you're not the judge. You don't know. God knows. And these three neighbors came around. They said, Job, somewhere in your life there's something wrong. Job, uh, you just kind of hypocritical. That's all there is about it. Because righteous men don't suffer like you suffer. But they were dead wrong. And God said to Job, uh, God told the devil, rather, you can't touch Job's soul. And the devil had to admit that God had him hedged in. God can hedge you in when the devil wants to try to destroy you. Many years ago, there was an old circuit rider. They have to leave on Saturday afternoon to make his round to his churches. He'd get on his horse and he'd take off. He lived out in the woods in the country. And it's kind of dangerous in that area. And he always hated to leave his family. But he knew that God could take care of him. And before he would leave every Saturday, he'd get his family, his wife, his little children around. And they'd get on their knees and he'd pray. He'd say, now Lord, I'm going on a mission for you now. I'll be gone tonight and I'll be preaching tomorrow. And Lord, I'm leaving my precious wife and darling babies here. And this is a dangerous place. And Lord, I'm asking you in the name of Jesus to protect my wife and my children while I'm gone. Thank you, Lord. You know that man left one Saturday. And then on Sunday morning when his wife got up to go out to the wood pile to get some wood to cook breakfast, there was a dead man. There in the wood pile with an axe in his hand. What had happened? That man came and picked up that axe. He was going into that preacher's house, probably to kill that preacher's wife and his children. And when he picked up that axe, God said, Oh, no, you don't, buddy. 
Bang, God killed him. He fell dead in the wood pile. God had that preacher's family hedged around about. And God said to the devil, you can't touch my servant Job's soul. And the devil said, you got a hedge around him. God said, yes, I got a hedge around him. And you can't get over that hedge. And God can put a hedge around you. Sometimes you may be walled in, but you can't, you just know you're not walled over. You can always look up. And God can put a hedge around you that the devil can't get through. And God was using all of this testing, the trials here, to help his servant Job to test him and to prove to the devil that he had a servant that wouldn't bow and wouldn't bend. And this man Job was that man. God hedged him in. And Job said, I know that God is trying me. And when I come forth, I'm coming forth as pure gold. Job did not become embittered. Many years ago, I was in a revival meeting in the Cherokee Avenue Baptist Church in Atlanta, Georgia. And I brought this message on Job that I'm bringing here this morning. I didn't know who was in the audience. And there was a couple who came to hear me that night. They hadn't been all the week. At one time, he was a deacon of the church, probably still on the deacon board, a man and his wife, and they came that night, it was on Friday night, I believe, to hear me preach. I preached on this sermon I'm preaching this morning along this line. They sat back there and listened. When I gave the invitation, that man's wife came running, weeping to that altar. Her husband turned as pale as a sheet and got up and stomped out that door and went out the front door. After the service, the pastor told me the story. He said, Brother Edwards, I want to tell you about that couple. He said they had a little boy, and he was out one day playing on the street, and his ball got away and went across the street, and he ran across the street to get the ball, and a car ran over the little fella and killed him. He said, you know, that couple were faithful members of my church, and he's on my deacon board. And they became embittered. I couldn't talk with them. Nobody could talk with them. They turned embittered. They turned against God. They blamed God for the child being killed. They said they would never go to church again. They'd have nothing else to do with God because he let their child get killed. And he said, Preach Edwards, I've been working with that couple, trying to help them and trying to let them see they should not be embittered toward God. That God knows what he's doing. And so that night, his wife came, all broken up. And she asked God to forgive her and restore her back the joy of God's salvation. And God did. Her husband would not come. He was still embittered. He steeled himself against God even more so. Walked out that door, slammed that door, and out in the yard he went. I don't know whatever happened to him. I will say this. If he did not get away from that attitude and get straightened out, the man is probably dead today. I will say he's probably, I'm not saying that I know he is, or, but he probably would be a man that embittered. You cannot be a saved person and become that embittered against God and blame God for things like that and continue on like that and live very long. I don't believe you can. And it's a very dangerous thing to become embittered in time of trials and testings. I may be speaking to someone today, you've gone through some very severe trials. Maybe in your own body, in your own home, among your companions, or your own children, or your relatives, or on your job. You've gone through some bitter testings and trials. If you're a child of God, if you'll stay true to God, and remain true to God, and serve God one of these days, these trials and testings are going to bring you through as pure gold. Now this man Job in the end, when he stood true to God and prayed for his friends that criticized him, God restored back to Job his health. God gave him back 10 more children, he'd buried 10. God gave him seven sons and three of the most beautiful girls in the land. And God restored him back all of his money all of his kinfolks came and gave him his money back and restored that back. And in the end, he had far more than he had in the beginning because he stood true to God. 
He couldn't eat and bite. He couldn't sleep at night. His wife didn't treat him right, but he still loved God and served God and had more in the end than had the beginning. And then the old man died. He saw his children's children, his grandchildren. And when the old man died, seven sons and three beautiful daughters and his grand youngins followed the old man's coffin to the graveyard. And no doubt they said, thank God for grandpa. He's the greatest man that ever lived. He is a wonderful servant. Thank God for daddy. There's been nobody like him. Thank God for my daddy. And they stood around that grave and said he was a great one. Thank God for the memory of our precious daddy and granddaddy. What a wonderful man. Oh, because he stood true to God. With believers, it may rain in the morning. It may thunder at noon. A storm may come up in the afternoon. But ere the sun goes down, it must be clear, and you can sail into the port softly. Let's stand our feet. Father, I pray today you'll take the message and use it to thy glory. May thy name be honored. There may be some dear precious child today of thine that's going through testings, trials, temptations. Maybe some in this building going through the same but God, give us all grace to stand when they come because we must have thy grace and thy strength. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. What's the number, Brother Gibson? Number 81. Number 81. We're going to sing two stanzas. Number 81, two stanzas. And as we sing, if you're here, you need to come forward to be saved. Come back to God. Join the church for any reason. I want you to come while we sing two stanzas. Just as I am with If God is speaking, will you come? For any reason, you need to come forward. Two stanzas, one more. If nobody responds, be it. 